Hi, I'm John the Banking Systems Engineer, and today I'm going to take apart the video Money Banking in the Federal Reserve by the Ludwig von Mises Institutes uh, and Murray Rothbard, the uh, Austrian School of Economics. Now, you may have heard about this or not, they're the gold nuts, and I'm going to take apart the gold nuts today. But to understand and get the jokes and laugh along with me, you have to understand how the banking system really works like poker chips. Now, there's the section where you get new chips when you bring in your marker, your IOU, your debt, whatever. And then there's another section where people can deposit their old chips, the safety deposit section in most casinos. Okay? Now, the fractional reserve banking is not allowed to lend out new chips until they get a call from the safety deposit section saying, hey, I just got a hundred bucks deposited over here in old chips. You can now lend out 90 in new ones. So that's how the fractional reserve bank works, like a casino bank regulated by the safety deposit section. When they get new deposits over there, you're allowed to issue out new chips over here. And that's how the money supply goes up and down. That is a perfect model of the fractional reserve banking system. You're going to need it to follow along this video. Second part is inflation. There are two possible inflations. If you got $100 chasing 100 potatoes, and you have more money, more chips issued into circulation for some unknown reason, then of course you would have a shift of value. Each chip would buy you less. But there's another possibility. You could have the same chips chasing less collateral, which is caused by foreclosures, which is caused by interest rates, which cause the debt to grow beyond people's amount to pay it with, they get knocked out of their mortgage death gamble and the collateral is seized and resulting in the same money principal left in the hands of the winners, the whole hundred, now only buying 90 potatoes. So you have to understand that I call him Looney Ludwig. Every time he sees new money, he screams shift the inflation without understanding there could be another possibility. So here we go, money banking and the Fed Reserve by the Von Mises Institute. Von Mises Institute's Money Banking and the Federal Reserve. <laughs> The Federal Reserve System virtually controls the nation's monetary system. Yet it is accountable to no one. It has no budget. It is subject to no audit. And no congressional committee knows of or can truly supervise its operations. These are the words of the late Professor Murray N. Rothbard, economist and academic of the Ludwig von Mises Institute. The Institute is dedicated to the ideals of a free market and sound money. This program is dedicated to the memory of Murray and Rothbard and his prolific work on money and banking. Yeah. Not very good work. <laughs> have steadily declined. Incomes have remained flat or fallen, and the opportunities and security we once took for granted have begun to fade. Things are bad. For most families, one income no longer pays the bills. It requires two or more incomes to afford a home, pay medical and child care expenses, and put children through school. Unless present trends change, young workers are unlikely to ever live as well as their parents. Wonder why? Good jobs for the future are harder to come by. Education doesn't count for what it once did. Now notice you can't have a job without a paycheck. So, if you're having a lack of paychecks, automatically you have a lack of jobs. 
So while they may be looking around on where to find jobs, I'd always be looking around on where to find paychecks. Taxes continue to rise while Social Security is going bankrupt. Private pensions are no longer reliable. Economic volatility and uncertainty are on the rise. Politicians espouse numerous theories about the cause of this country's economic woes. I got one. Seldom, however, do these officials look below the surface. The roots of our economic hills can be traced to central banking and our present monetary system. Not the central banking. The Federal Reserve claims to manage our money. Instead, it makes our money worth less and less every day. It has generated continuous and worsening business cycles and lowered our living standards. It's really no different from a burglar in your house wanting to steal your money. That's what the Federal Reserve does. It, it depreciates your savings, it takes away your uh, economic security, and it ought to be treated as an institution that does that rather than something of alleged benefit. Money is supposed to serve as a reliable standard of economic value, not a source of instability. Until we restore sound money and take away the government's ability to debase it, we have little hope of restoring the freedom and prosperity that made America great. And uh, we really have a choice of what we want in money. Do we want money that's going to be losing its value every year, or do we want money that's going to be gaining in value? If you are happy with your money losing value, then you want the present system. If you want money to increase in value, then you want a gold standard. Oh, gold increases in value. <laughs> Yellow rock increases in value. <coughs> what is money? As the good that makes exchange possible, it's the foundation of every economic activity. In the earliest times, people traded goods and services directly. This form of exchange is known as barter. As, um, if a fishing tribe uh, desired to, um, to have maybe wheat, um, which they themselves did not produce, they would seek out uh, other individuals that produced wheat, uh, and then they would exchange there for fish. But barter had limitations in the marketplace. Well, actually, people perceived pretty quickly problems with that direct exchange. Um, if you wanted, for example, uh, fish, and uh, you had wheat, but the people who had fish didn't desire the wheat, uh, you were stuck. Okay? Unless you went out and found some other good, possibly berries, that everyone in that society consumed. Then you would trade your wheat for the, for, for the berries in full confidence then that you could turn around and trade the berries for the fish or anything else that you desired. Eventually, the most widely accepted goods in a society became valued for their use in indirect exchange. Money is simply another name for the most generally accepted medium of exchange. Actually, it's not. This book by David Astle called The Babylonian Woe is a history of fractional reserve loan sharking in antiquity. No other book like it. Now, coinage was developed within the last 3,000 years. And before that, well, actually, gold measures were bef but before that what did people use when you're stuck with fish and you want wheat credit was used they used clay tablets inscribed with iou so much wheat and that became a form of money clay poker chips just like in many casinos today so credit credit tokens were issued like a little piece of round leather that said worth one cow these were tokens that were created as credits amongst themselves. So, to make it sound like barter was the only way they could do business when they had already evolved a very sophisticated credit system misses the whole of antiquity and how the loan sharks sucked everybody dry in those days too. By sucking them on the gold. Throughout history, many goods have served as money. 
feathers from the Quetzal bird were used for exchange by the Mayan Indians up to the 15th century in Central America. What was a feather worth? Tea leaves compressed into bricks were traded in East Asia well, through the 1800s. You can drink the tea. Wampum shells were mined ah. with American Indians. Yes. While early American colonists traded beaver pelts, which had a high value both at home and abroad. Notice at no point do they tell you what these were worth. What's a wampum worth? Is it a horse? Is it a what? What? Never linked to the collateral. Metal coins first emerged in Greece and Asia Minor during the 7th century BC. That's right. Before then, credit. And silver were valued for their use in beauty and jewelry and the decorative arts. They were durable, easily divisible, and limited in supply. These precious metals also had a high value to weight ratio making them easily transportable. You might think back, or we can think back to a time when, when iron was used as money, for example, in Africa. Um, but imagine going into, uh, into Sears Roebuck and trying to purchase, um, uh, let's say, a lawnmower for $350. That would take a ton of iron. How about a clay poker chip that said, ton of iron? Whereas we've only taken an ounce of gold. Same idea. Chip weighs less. In 1536, <laughs> less than 50 years after Christopher Columbus set foot on American soil, a Spanish mint in Mexico City struck the first coins made in the New World. These silver coins eventually found their way into the British colonies. Great Britain's mercantilist policies deliberately tried to keep precious metals out of America, so the Spanish milled dollar became the unofficial currency. It was often divided into eight pieces for smaller transactions, hence the term pieces of eight, with one quarter of the coin being two bits. In 1792, Thomas Jefferson adopted the dollar as this country's official monetary unit. He looked around, he investigated, and said, what were the American people using as money? And that was the dollar. And so that's why that, that dollar became the standard of the United States. And we went on to the gold silver standard and started making gold coins in the air. Why not copper? Ten dollar gold coin. Jefferson in particular spoke eloquently of the dangers of paper money. During the war for independence, the Continental Congress printed vast sums of paper money out of thin air to finance the army. The diluted Now remember, Lincoln did the same thing with greenbacks. King Henry did the same thing with wooden tallies. He created money out of thin air, just like a casino does. He took the tally and he spent it, and at the end of the year he taxed it back. Lincoln took his greenbacks, spent them, and at the end of the year taxed them back. That's how it works. So when they just say the Continentals were printed and spent into circulation in exchange for goods and services, and then suddenly they inflated, what went wrong? Oh, they don't mention the counterfeiting. That's what went wrong. Money supply naturally depreciated to almost nothing. Naturally. Didn't mention the counterfeiting, right? How naturally does paper poker chips lose their value? As opposed to golden poker chips based on the same collateral. Into the phrase, not worth a continental. Sad, eh? Bankers must love that. Those, who tended to be patriotic Americans, <laughs> concerned about wanting America to be free of the British, uh, British control, lost everything. Whereas the Tories, who wanted nothing to do with this American government money, immediately got rid of it, uh, were benefited. Uh, and That's right. The counterfeiting only affected the patriots. <laughs> Pelletai Webster, the first American economist, and others who looked at this saw that this paper money unbacked by, by gold was extremely dangerous. I know, paper money backed by our collateral, but unbacked by gold is extremely dangerous, he says. As early as the 16th century in Europe, goldsmiths stored gold coins for their customers for I... the fee and issued receipts for the gold to the depositor. Thus began the use of paper as money. In other words, 
If you came in and deposited 10 ounces of gold for safekeeping, you got back receipts in the amount of 10 gold ounces. And those receipts entitled you to instantaneously redeem that gold. These receipts soon became... By the way, just because coinage was first started in 700 BC doesn't mean that gold as the medium of exchange between big shots wasn't thousands of years before. Babylonian woe says many thousands of years before. Widely accepted as a means of exchange since it was yeah. easier and safer to use right? the receipts for significant transactions. And they could have had chips based on eggs or chickens, right? They would have been just as convenient as gold, right? This was the origin of banknotes as money substitutes. These first bankers then took this process one step further. In effect, uh, if the goldsmith had 1,000 ounces of gold and 1,000 ounces of legitimate receipts being held by the deposit of that gold, he could increase his profits by merely printing up another 1,000 ounces worth of receipts and lending them out. Okay. In which case, he would affect... In exchange for new collateral to back up those new receipts. Nothing wrong with that. That's just regular poker chips. Ah, but these guys never take into account the interest that causes the real problem, the positive feedback on the debt side of the ledger. They never talk about that problem. It's always paper money causes problems as opposed to gold and chips. Effectively get 50% reserve banking or fractional reserve banking. Only a, a fraction, 50% of, of the receipts were now backed by gold. There was no longer a one-to-one -one rate. So 100% of the receipts were backed by collateral. Well, actually, 50 with gold and 50 with new collateral. But only 50 with gold. So because they don't account for the new 50 in collateral, they just say, oh, must be inflation of 100%, half gone. Prices are up. Ratio of paper to gold. Now there could be three or four pieces of paper in circulation for every unit of gold in the vault. With three or four pieces of collateral. And all these clowns see is, wow, less and less of our chips are based on gold. Must be inflationary when more and more of our chips are based on collateral. And again, the interest causes the problem, not the fact that we've got chips based on only collateral and not gold. These bankers were no longer simply storing or warehousing gold for a fee. No. They were artificially inflating the money supply and loaning out these phony receipts at interest. Oh, mentioned interest. But actually, they weren't inflating the money supply, were they? Because they had collateral backing up all the new chips, didn't they? This system became known as fractional reserve banking and was later transported to the early American colonies. It formed the root of American commercial banking and ultimately the Federal Reserve System. This is a fraudulent system. It's not allowed in any other business. Uh, it's not fraudulent. It's legal for them to issue new chips in exchange for collateral. They got the legislation authorizing the banking system to create the medium of exchange. There's nothing fraudulent about creating the medium of exchange out of nothing, just as there's nothing fraudulent about a casino creating its chips out of nothing. Charging interest on it, problems, yeah, but these guys are complaining about the wrong thing. You had a grain warehouse that uh, had loaned out the grain it was supposed to have in storage. Well, that's considered criminal, the guy go to jail. But the banks are uh, the one industry that's allowed to well, what did he do when he issued the other receipts? He got other grain or other collateral, didn't he? To get away with this and to profit from it. Alexander Hamilton became the first Treasury Secretary and in 1791 set up the first Bank of the United States as America's central bank to expand the supply of paper money for the benefit of the government and the commercial banks. Yeah, Alexander Hamilton was a bad guy. So what? Alexander Hamilton um, believed in a strong central government and he saw a central bank as one of the means by which the, um, the government could be centralized and by which its power uh, could, 
could be expressed. Thomas Jefferson opposed this view. He saw a central bank as an undemocratic tool of the Northeastern banking establishment. It was dismantled after 20 years. Jefferson was an opponent of, of, of the strong central government and um, at all points wanted to remove um, the central bank. In 1816, the federal government made another attempt to set up an inflationary central bank. But this second bank of... Inflationary because they're going to issue new chips and they forget about the collateral. The United States was denounced by President Andrew Jackson as a monster bank for benefiting a few at the expense of many. They inflated the money supply, uh, which brought about uh, a boom initially that is prosperity to the country, uh, followed by a bust. When they stopped inflating the money supply, uh, many businesses that had depended on the low interest rates that were introduced or induced by the, um, the initial inflation went out of business. So when they stopped the issuance of chips and started calling them in and everybody had to call all the debtors in and try and collect and they had a crash like they always do, so what? You could have done that with gold chips. They've had panics with gold throughout history. Jackson succeeded in abolishing the second central bank in 1836. But by then, speculators had set up hundreds of new private banks with little or no gold to back the notes they issued. Maybe that's because nobody had any gold. <laughs> Need chips, but no one's got gold. What do you want us to do? The nation's monetary system became more stable when the United States introduced a gold standard in 1834. The dollar was worth approximately one twentieth of an ounce of gold. The gold standard was understood by, by the Founding Fathers, by Andrew Jackson and others, as being a, a, a money of the people. That is, it was a hard money. A money. <laughs> Jeez. I'd say it was the money of the bullion brokers. <laughs> the that could not be people. tampered with. Um, that could not be um, inflated to uh, permit government... Well, that's not true. Babylonian woe has a history of inflations that went on throughout history before there was any paper money, okay? God, what a bunch of... Uh, expenditures um, skyrocketing. But by 1862, Abraham Lincoln needed to fund his invasion of the South. So once again, the government began to print up paper money. Yes, sir. Poker chips paid out in exchange for work. No gold. <laughs> Basically, the United States went off the gold standard in order to finance uh, the Civil War. Okay. And you'll find... You can't imagine how many times countries have to go off the gold standard because it's too lunatic to have everybody starving because there's no money. In history, that um, almost every large war, every major war, uh, has involved a departure from the gold standard. That's right. Only when you're ready to kill yourselves will they issue enough chips for you to get in the game. <laughs> Remember, where'd the money come from for the war that wasn't there a year before for peaceful production? Because the gold standard puts strict limits on, on government financing. Lincoln's notes became the... And I can't think of anything more stupid than putting a strict limit on King Henry's financing of his realm using his interest-free tally sticks and letting everybody have a job, right? Known as greenbacks because they were printed in green ink rather than the usual black ink on the reverse side. These so-called fiat notes were deemed legal tender by the government Fiat means you can pay your tax with them. Now, I think that's pretty good stuff. But they were not redeemable in gold. Oh, just taxes. War issued a tremendous number of greenbacks. Gold was still circulating, but people were forced to accept these greenbacks uh, as if they were a part of gold. The government's power to print unbacked paper notes would later become the pillar of the Federal Reserve System. Notice unbacked. Again, they keep always saying that this is unbacked when it is backed up by whatever it was paid to get. 
Oh, these guys, jeez, they don't see the collateral, and then they won't even admit there is collateral. They lie about it. Worked in Argentina. <laughs> After the Civil War, the nation's monetary system became sounder when the U.S. adopted the gold standard. Now, go find out how many times there were panics and crashes and foreclosures and all sorts of crises over these next years as they pulled all the greenbacks out of circulation. Go read Financial Scandals by a Ms. Emery. What a story. What a litany of crimes. But sucking all the greenbacks out of circulation had to be done first. Don't want people with their own chips. We went back on the gold standard. Yeah. In 1879, and had probably the greatest period of growth and of prosperity ever in the country's history. That's right, the rich guys had a lot of chips to invest in railroads and stuff while millions starved. These are all the stories about these strikers and the, you know, the guys who are always striking against the big oppressive machinery. This was the golden age of gold. <laughs> output of goods and services grew at an unprecedented rate of 4% per year. And that's what happened when you got truly well enslaved people. <laughs> the reason being that um, with a sound money um, and without sound the, money. the ability to manipulate the interest rate, um, we had a lot of, of genuine saving and in fact... How does gold stop manipulation of interest rates? Especially when everything else is linked to food and clothes and houses, right? Which then led to more capital goods and higher labor productivity in the United States. In the midst of this prosperity, the oh. big industrialists and financiers prosperity. were willing to expand their empires with the help of government. Oh, with the past. what a prosperous time for the billionaires and their empires. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's when Rockefeller was busy raping the country. <laughs> Prosperous times. <laughs> Since the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887, the large railroads succeeded in blocking their smaller competitors through regulation. The ICC was put in place in order to protect um, the, the railroad owners from competition. Okay? It was not the case that, that um, it was going to protect consumers uh, or shippers. In fact, consumers were hurt because ultimately no kidding, that consumers were hurt. It didn't work. Oops. <laughs> By 1896, they were poised to do the same thing with the banks. Two camps emerged as leaders in this economic war. They were led by J.P. Morgan, the world's most powerful private banker, and John D. Rockefeller, the oil tycoon. Morgan and Rockefeller were great adversaries, but despite sure. their business differences, they both favored a central bank. They wanted cheap credit and an inflated money supply to finance the expansion of their empires. Oh, that's right. These guys are in favor of expensive credit, so you got to pay a lot of interest to get their gold. Together, they led the campaign to sell the idea to the American public, which later led to the founding of the Federal Reserve. If the American people um, got wind of the fact that this bank was not in their interests, okay, in, in fact, they, they understood that it was in the interests of, of the financial elites who would use it to inflate the money supply and in doing so um, increase their own revenues. What does that mean? They would use it to inflate the money supply. In general, they're going to put more money into circulation and everybody knows more money causes inflation. All right, let's talk about Looney Ludwig. Enough. Imagine we're all playing in a poker game and there's 10 of us at the table. We all bought in for a thousand bucks. First guy goes broke. Another guy comes over to the table with his thousand bucks and chips, sits down. And all of a sudden, Looney Ludwig starts piping up. Inflation! There's not going to be 1,100 chips on the table. You know, and we got to slap him in the head. Looney Ludwig, come on now. There's another thousand in collateral at the cage. There's not going to be inflation. There's 1,100 there now and there's 1,100 chips here. Come on, Looney Ludwig, don't worry about new chips. Anyway, another guy goes broke. 
So she sits out, new guy comes in with a thousand. There's Looney Ludwig again, worried about inflation. There's now 1200 on the table. Yeah, but there's now 1200 in the cage. Calm down, Looney Ludwig. Well, that's what these are. Every time they hear about more money, Looney Ludwig has a fit. And that's what this is going on. Um, there would have been hell to pay. Uh, legislation would have never pass under those conditions. So it had to be sold to the American people as a way of making their currency more elastic. Elastic? What does that mean? The bank reform campaign received a boost in 1907 when there was a run on some of New York's biggest banks thanks to their fractional reserves. Panic spread among depositors who got wind of the bank's insolvency and tried to withdraw their money. Now, interesting point. When someone gets a loan at a bank, they're getting new chips, which means that they didn't lend out the old chips. And those chips never leave your account. So when they talk about a bank panic, and all of a sudden your chips aren't in your account, what went on? Because we know they didn't lend them out and not get them back. They were never out of your account. So how can you all of a sudden end up with no chips in your account? Think about that. There's only one way. It's written off. The Knickerbocker Trust failed, and two other institutions went to the brink of bankruptcy despite a $35 million bailout from J.P. Morgan. Wall Street swiftly adopted the fear of bank failures to sell the idea of a central bank or lender of last resort to the American public. So the Federal Reserve was to be the lender of last resort in case any bank got into trouble, they wouldn't have to worry, they'd get the cash from Washington. Bank runs and failures continued at an alarming rate. In 1908, the National Monetary Commission, headed by John D. Rockefeller Jr.'s father-in-law, sent a... Why 1908? Oh, they didn't mention the 1907 crash. Dr. Nelson Aldrich was set up to push for a central bank. In November of 1910, under the guise of a duck hunting trip, six men took a secret train ride to an exclusive private club on Jekyll Island, Georgia, to write a central banking act. The classified gathering read like a who's who of American banking. There were two Rockefeller men, Aldrich and Frank Vanderlip of the National City Bank of New York, two Morgan men, Henry P. Davidson from Morgan Bank, and Charles D. Norton, president of Morgan's First National Bank of New York, Paul Warburg, a Kuhn Low partner, and Assistant Treasury Secretary A.P. Andrew, who was friendly to both camps. They spent a week at the luxurious club as Morgan's guests, crafting the proposals that would form the basis of the Federal Reserve System. It would be three years before their vision was realized. Just before Christmas 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was passed by Congress and signed by President Wilson. It established a Federal Reserve System to oversee monetary policy and regulate the commercial banks. It's no coincidence that the Federal Reserve System was established by the Wilson administration. This was the height of the Progressive Era, uh, a time of tremendous government expansion of uh, special interest deals in Washington. Too bad they didn't mention they passed the Income Tax Act at the same time. Got to be able to collect to pay the bankers their interest, right? There are 12 regional reserve banks concentrated in the East and the Midwest. The Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve controls and coordinates their activities. The board is made up of seven members appointed by the president. Even though there were 14 12 years, banks, I think. Wall Street soon ran the show. As president of the New York Fed, Morgan protege Benjamin Strong seized control of the board's open market committee operations. Strong would remain the dominant force at the Fed until his death in 1928. Nice to see names of the crooks, eh? The Federal Open Market Committee, now based in Washington, directs the Fed's most important instrument of monetary policy, the purchase and sale of government securities on the open market. To increase the supply of money and credit, that is to inflate, 
the Fed buys government secure. All new money ain't inflation, Looney Ludwig. Release from a few hand-picked firms with newly created money. To tighten money and credit, the Fed sells securities. In this, it can act on its own discretion. Every government wants the ability to create new money. Now, why would King Henry have wanted the ability to create his own money? It's an alternative to raising taxes. It's a smart alternative. The difference is between front tax and back tax. Right now, they tax up front, and you got to pray they don't waste it. But under King Henry, he spent his tallies up front, then he back taxed when he told you what he'd spent it on. So, all you need is an interest-free source of tallies. And if they got to use popsicle sticks like he did, fine, split them, use them. But if you've got an interest-free source of tallies, you can do a back tax. And then you can justify what your money was spent on, like King Henry did, or Abraham Lincoln, or the Continental Congress. We spent it on establishing our civilization and winning our rights backed up by hours of labor that should be honored by future generations. Taxes, we said, when they're raised, tend, tend to be, evoke a lot of um, uh, resistance among the public. It's much less painless to increase the money supply. The effects, um, the, the negative effects, don't occur until six months, a year, two years later. We'll go into negative effects of tallies in a minute. At which time, the increasing prices can, can be blamed on other factors, the weather, um, speculators, and so on. Interest rates, you got to pay back more to the guy who loaned you the money to produce your goods, you got to raise your prices, right? Geez, he forgot about interest rates. Driving up prices. Another device the Fed uses to control the amount of money in circulation is setting the discount rate. Interest rate. This is the interest rate charged to member banks when they borrow short term from the so-called discount window. Starts the cycle, they if say. If the Fed lowers the discount rate for its loans, commercial banks will likely borrow more from the Fed. This increases the amount of funds banks have to lend. Bank credit thus becomes cheaper as reflected in lower interest rates on bank loans and credit cards. The Notice how the lie is perpetuated while the truth was actually said. You got the impression there that the money got re-lent out to the people below. But that's not what he said. He said the money that they received allowed them to lend out credit to the people below. So they didn't lie, but they certainly gave you the impression that it was the same money, didn't they? Increase in funds available for banks to lend also increases the amount of money in the economy. The Fed can also manipulate the nation's money supply by raising or lowering the reserve requirement. Banks are required to set aside a percentage of their deposits as reserves to meet depositors' demands. When the Fed was established in 1913, it cut reserve requirements in half over the next four years doubling the money supply by the end of World War One, And never mentioning that all of that money had to be paid back with interest. The real problem. Don't you have to wonder why they need reserves to cover your deposits when your deposits haven't ever left your account? The next four years, doubling the money supply by the end of World War One. But the Fed's real power lies in its monopoly to create money. Although the U.S. was still on the gold standard in 1913, it was quickly eroded as the Fed continued to expand the money supply. Looney Ludwig! The first step was backing Federal Reserve notes by only 40% in gold. Allowing... And 100% collateral, more often. ...the money supply to be increased two and a half times. <laughs> Remember, if they borrow and get collateral for two and three times the gold, they can say, I mean, the amount of previous loans based on gold, they can now say your money's lost its value relative to the gold, even though you had all that extra collateral. Hmm. 
Inflationary oh. effect of fractional reserve banking Ludwig. is also heightened by the central bank. The commercial banks are permitted to create checkbook money on top of Federal Reserve notes. In exchange for your collateral. That is to say, the commercial banks are only obliged by law um, to hold reserves in the form of Federal Reserve notes of 10% to back all demand deposits that they have. 90% of their demand deposits are backed by nothing. But your collateral. <laughs> the Federal Reserve System adds another inflationary layer to an already unstable banking system. For example, if the central bank has $100 worth of gold reserves in its vaults and a 10% reserve requirement, it can print up $1,000 of new notes and deposits which become the reserves of the commercial banks. The commercial banks take this $1,000, and if they're required to hold 10% again in reserve, they can multiply the $1,000 into $10,000. Oh, he skipped the whole fractional reserve process by saying they can make it go from 1,000 to 10, as if they've created 10 times the amount, and they may create the 10 times the amount. That's not how it works. It's called fractional reserve because out of the hundred that's deposited, they can lend out 90% new chips, but still 90%. And when that gets deposited, 81. And when that goes in, 72. And that's how fractional reserve relending multiplies up to the 10,000, whole process of which they skipped. The Von Mises School of Economics through fractional reserve loans. Oh, through fractional reserve loans. So an inverted pyramid is created with $100 worth of gold or real money at the bottom. Real money! $10,000 of inflated paper money at the top. And both kinds of money buy you the same stuff. So what's the difference between the real money and the not real money? As this $10,000 in new paper money circulates in the economy, it drives prices up. Why? If it's backed up by the collateral, why would it change? Oh, 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 they think inflation, they forget about collateral. Right, right, right. Therefore, reducing the buying power of ordinary citizens. Yes, no money what does that. Money. The people who get the new money first and are able to, to buy products with it uh, benefit, and the people who get it at the end lose because when they go to spend it, Prices have already gone up, and so they're able to buy less. And so there's a transfer of wealth and of power uh, from some segments of the economy to others because of the actions of the central bank. So using chips is inflationary if they're not considering the collateral. But if you do your chips properly, it can't be inflationary. Can it? And basically those who benefit are the government itself, uh, big banks, sure. and government contractors, okay. and uh, anybody who's closely associated with the federal government. Absolutely. Inflation benefits all these bad guys. If only they figured out what was causing it for real. By making enormous amounts of credit easily available, yeah. the Fed can also drive down interest rates, yeah. sending out the wrong signal to investors. <laughs> Low interest rate chips is a bad signal to loan shark investors. Yes, you're right, it is. It sets in motion an unsustainable investment boom oh. that carries with it the seeds of its own destruction. Why is it unsustainable for everyone to end up with a job? It's this business cycle that is ultimately responsible for economic disasters such as the Great Depression. Soon after the Federal Reserve was established, the U.S. entered World War I. Once again, the government temporarily abandoned the gold standard to print more money to finance the war effort. Now, if they'd have done that, like Lincoln, well, there would have been a lot of good. But they didn't print the money. They let the banks print the money. And then they went and borrowed the money, and then ended up taxing everybody forever to pay them the interest on that borrowed money. But these boys just call it 
more money, more borrowed money. The U.S. government borrowed heavily, and the national debt ballooned from one billion to twenty-seven billion dollars. How much of that was interest, and how much was that was actually stuff you got for? Third spike of inflation followed. This set off a cycle of rapid expansion and contraction in the economy. <laughs> I can understand a expansion, but what caused the contraction? <clears throat> they raised the interest rates and started calling in all the loans. I wonder if they'll mention that. In the overheated economy. Overheated. It's inflation. Everybody having a job. Overheated. Economics. Causing interest rates to nearly double over the next 18 months. Bingo! The real cause of the crash. By 1921, the market began to recover. New technology helped to increase productivity. Markets developed for new cars and appliances. <laughs> what does that mean? Markets developed. As if suddenly people want them and now they got the money to buy them. When they say markets, they mean purchasing power. So, where did this purchasing power develop from to finance this boom? The 1920s were a period of extraordinary growth. Yeah. But behind the scenes, much of this growth was distorted by a Fed-generated inflationary credit expansion. Remember, issuing your own chips based on just collateral, not gold causes inflation. This is the roaring 20s. This was a period of increasing affluence. It does go to show what enough chips can do for a society though, doesn't it? Increasing affluence for everybody. That hid the inflation from American economists. That hid the fact there was not enough gold from the American economists. People had enough money. Must have been inflationary. generated bubble burst in the Wall Street crash of October 1929. Oops, just went pop, suddenly. 30% interest rates, everybody can't pay, everybody's calling in their debtors, bang, everybody's being foreclosed on, that's what happened. Just didn't burst, it, you know, burst upon people. Speculators who had borrowed money to buy shares when bank credit was readily available saw the stock market lose one-third of its value. Bank loans totaling seven billion dollars were outstanding. As the speculators defaulted on their loans, bank failures spiraled and the Great Depression set in. So as the debtors defaulted on their loans, if you had money in your account that had never been lent out, they had to write it off. That's how the system works. It didn't actually go anywhere, they just cancelled it. Depositors lost their bank accounts, both their savings deposits and checking deposits. Zip, gone. They saw them disappear into thin air. Same place they came from. In 1932, Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected president he was and quickly implemented a New Deal policy. And he banned the community currencies in 2,000 communities which resulted, the census shows, in seven million less Americans than there should have been. Biggest mass murder of Americans in history, FDR, by banning community currencies that were saving people. They called let's economic lifeboats, he banned their lifeboats. I'm spending us to prosperity, even though we need to... Well, actually, spending us to prosperity is what King Henry did. How can he manage to pull it off and they don't think we can. Lower taxes and lower spending. Yes. His administration would seek unprecedented amounts of money to finance its big government programs. Oh, they forgot to mention that he was going to borrow it again instead of creating it himself. Gee, that doesn't seem to be on their agenda, creating your own money by government. Oh, yeah, they're gold bugs. In his inaugural speech on March 4th, 1933, 
Roosevelt vowed to put an end to poverty and the unemployment law <laughs> and get people back to work. Then they're long, they're less. The depression got worse. Thanks to no kidding. central planning, oh. FDR only succeeded in making the money. It wasn't central planning, it was central banning. Terry system, even less sound. Let's go. Taking office, the president declared a four-day nationwide bank holiday, Ooh. absolving the bankrupt fractional reserve banks of any need to repay their depositors. Well, I never heard of that. But before the banks reopened, That's why they the love Roosevelt him. administration had to come up with a scheme that would lead people to believe that new deposits would be safe. It created the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation to lull the public into a sense of security. In reality, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation holds just half of 1% of all the deposits it insures. <laughs> but what half people are telling is that the Fed, as the lender of last resort, would step in and print whatever money would be necessary to prevent a massive bank run. In the 1930s, control of the Fed by the New York bankers was drawing to a close. The Morgan era ended when President Roosevelt, who was no friend of the Morgans, oh, appointed really? Mariner Eccles as its governor. Eccles, a Republican from Utah, moved the activities of the Open Market Committee to Washington. President Roosevelt was on hand for the dedication of a new three and a half million dollar building to house the Fed. Good to see you. Progress. To progress toward the ideal oh, yes. of an America in which every worker will be able to provide his family at all times. Wow, the Fed sure worked. Ever rising standard of American. Ever country. rising American living, yes. 1933 also marked the beginning of the end for the gold standard. There was no end to Roosevelt's appetite for spending on such New Deal programs as the gigantic $13 billion Tennessee. His appetite for borrowing, borrowing. I'd love him to have spent it from the Treasury like Lincoln and the Continentals and like King Henry. He borrowed it. These guys just don't understand where governments get money, do they? School of Valley Authority which flooded vast areas of productive farmland Ooh. to provide government-subsidized electricity. The Works Progress Administration, which spent $11 billion on make-work jobs and port barrel public works. And where'd they get the $11 billion, you may ask, that they didn't tell us? But the U.S. currency was tied to gold, which limited the amount of money the Fed could print to pay for these costly projects. So the government scrapped the gold standard for American citizens in 1933. Yay! And then Roosevelt confiscated the people's gold. Who cares? You don't need it. <laughs> gold must be important. As in World War I, the warring parties in the Second World War abandoned the gold standard to finance the war with central bank-generated inflation. When you really gotta come up with the money to save yourself, only in wars, Gee, everybody seems to always abandon the gold standard that's keeping them short, right? In peacetime. After the war, there was an attempt to use the prestige of the gold standard to establish a global inflationary system. Must have been more chips. The financial leaders met at Bretton Woods in New Hampshire under the direction of the famous economist John Maynard King. How to issue new chips? Their idea was to set up a new international monetary system that would have both gold and inflation. Under this system, <laughs> both gold and inflation, which is new, not gold chips. <laughs> Calling our chips inflation. Tallies are inflation. It would be um, redeemable in gold, but only for foreign official institutions, central banks, and foreign governments, uh, at the rate of $35 per ounce. All other currencies would have fixed exchange rates with the U.S. dollar, and they would be redeemable in U.S. dollars. The New York Times editorialist 
Henry Hazlitt was one of the first to realize that this semi-gold standard would not succeed. <laughs> From the very beginning, it was doomed to failure, and this uh, uh, very poor dinosaur journalist at that time, Henry Hazlitt, predicted it wouldn't work. He's still a because dinosaur. He says the temptation will always be that the government will print more money uh, oh. because they will accept these dollars and they won't demand the gold and won't hold the government in check. And he was absolutely right. I know, spending money based on just collateral and not gold ain't right. <laughs> the 1960s, the U.S. government was trying to meet the cost of massive social welfare programs at home and the Vietnam War abroad. And they shot Kennedy before he could use silver certificates and not have a Vietnam War. <laughs> By printing more money, President Lyndon Johnson believed, the U.S. government could accomplish its goals without raising taxes, which may have caused a taxpayer revolt. In other words, it could have both guns and butter. Hey, he's always borrowing for the butter. We will and the guns. make sure that every dollar is spent with the threat and with the common sense, which recognizes how hard the taxpayer works in order to earn Thrifty but war the more money the U.S. printed, the more it eroded the value of the dollar. Oh, the more chips is in the circulation for collateral, the more it eroded the dollar. Looney Ludwig again. Nervous foreigners began redeeming their dollars in gold, as they were entitled to do under the Bretton Woods Agreement. After paying out billions in gold, the U.S. was left with $36 billion worth of outstanding debt to foreign creditors, and gold reserves worth just $18 billion. Oh, All that yellow rock missing. Rather than stop the inflation, in 1971, President Richard Nixon stop refused to redeem any more dollars. I directed Secretary Conley to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. It was the death knell for the Bretton Woods semi-gold standard and a triumph for the Federal Reserve. Yeah, wow. The dollar would no longer have even the illusion of a fixed value against other currencies. It would float against them, causing even more dislocation in foreign trade. Pretty weird, eh? They got all this collateral backing up their chips, and yet their chips float in value and massive uncertainties for businessmen. Worse, the final check on dollar creation disappeared, creating endless possibilities for inflation. Yes, yes. It, endless possibilities for the issuance of chips in exchange for collateral. Looney Lenny's inflation. So named Looney Ludwig. It's running at more than 300% since 1971, thanks to the Fed's power to create money out of thin air. Oh, chips out of thin air. Deposits. Oh. No U.S. federal budget has been balanced since it abandoned the gold standard. Well, no U.S. no budget's ever been balanced while they're on interest, right? I don't think that that's something that um, enhances the efficiency of our economy. Uh, I, I believe that that the best money is a market determined money, okay, such as the gold, such as we had under the gold standard. So he believes the best chips are the chips that have a value picked by the market instead of worth one egg or worth one hour. You know, a market picked value that changes. <laughs> In order to get back to market determined money, the Fed has to be abolished. There is not now, nor has there ever been, any direct control over the Fed by the President or Congress. The Actually, the president appoints the commissioners, but it's not much control. It's one, they last 14 years, so how many can you replace in four years? Worse than the Supreme Court. Meetings of the Federal Reserve Board are held in secret, and nobody knows exactly what goes on. If you watch the business report every night, commentators are constantly speculating about what the Fed might do. All eyes were on Washington today as the Federal Reserve met to decide the future direction of interest rates. Most economists expect the Fed to leave monetary policy unchanged. It has spawned a whole industry of Fed watchers who try to second-guess the Fed 
Federal Reserve has been surrounded by secrecy ever since its planning, its installation, and its operations to the present day. See if people find out what's going to happen with interest rates, they can bet on it. And that's why they have to hide it. The fact it's a death rate in a death gamble isn't really the worry. It's the fact someone might find out in advance and profit from that knowledge. That's why government can't do it in public. And the reason is because they can't tell the truth. If they told the truth, there'd be a revolution. There'd be a bunch of Americans. They're ready to all toss them out of the building. A recent attempt to open the Fed to public scrutiny came in 1993. The head of the House Banking Committee, Representative Henry Gonzalez of Texas, called for an independent audit of the Fed's operations. He wanted the proceedings of the Open Market Committee videotaped, with detailed minutes released within a week, instead of vague summaries issued several weeks later. Gonzalez also proposed that the President choose the 12 heads of the Fed's regional banks instead of powerful bankers. Predictably, Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan resisted the changes. What was surprising was President Bill Clinton's position. He declared the reforms would, quote, run the risk of undermining market confidence in the Fed. The guys the banker loves the most got to be left in charge or there'd be undermined confidence in the Fed. Bill Clinton, <laughs> the leader of his people. After the Mexican government inflated and devalued the peso in 1995, the Mexican economy went into a tailspin. Alan Greenspan lobbied con... Gee, bet your interest rates had something to do with that. They keep forgetting though, don't they? I went pop. <laughs> Congress and the Clinton administration for a $52 billion bailout. As it turned out, the Fed's member banks held as much as $26 billion in Mexican debt. I didn't want to get paid. The choice in the matter, American taxpayers and savers paid the bill. The congressmen themselves, from my experience there, they're pretty naive. And they're Going really after the petty theft, it's not the malfunction systemically. The banking committee uh, is aware of this and goes along with it. Uh, and they and they continue to perpetuate this myth that uh, the Federal Reserve brings about stability and they do good things for economic growth, even though they're the culprits. They're the ones who cause all the problems. They're the ones who cause the recession, the unemployment, and the downsizing of big business and all the uh, ill effects that we have to witness. But their PR job is excellent because they have convinced most congressmen that they are very necessary to maintain stability and economic growth and all these wonderful things that they uh, claim credit for. It is clear that the United States... All cannot... right. We're in a society where we can't keep trying for economic growth. What we want is economic conservation. That's the only way to do it. Cut down on wastage. Forget growing more just to be wasting more. I rely on Alan Greenspan or any other Fed chairman to fight the chronic inflation that has wrecked our savings, distorted our economy, redistributed income and wealth, and brought us devastating booms and busts. Oh, yes. Despite the established view, Greenspan, the Fed, and big commercial bankers are not the inflation fighters they pretend to be. The Fed and its allied banks are not part of the solution to inflation in the business. But yes, they are the inflation fighters since everybody believes raising interest rates fights inflation, you can bet bankers love to fight inflation. The cycle, they are the problem itself. To limit chronic inflation and boom-bust business cycles, the currency must... Oh, that's right. He's pointing out bankers like to lend out new chips. And, you know... Looney Ludwig always thinks new chips is inflation. Therefore, since bankers love loan sharking out new chips, that must be inflationary. Be back 100% by gold. That would remove the Fed's ability to print money, which amounts to no more than legalized counterfeiting. No, it doesn't. It's backed up by the collateral. Is poker chips counterfeiting? Instead, there would be a monetary system where gold serves to anchor the dollar. Where are they going to get the gold? Who's got any gold? Only a few bullion brokers got gold. 
My Lord, why do you think everybody goes off the gold standard anytime they want to develop something? Wars, usually. There's not enough gold. They forget, I guess. Rather than the fiat reserves created by the Fed, if we were to establish a real gold standard, the average American family would benefit tremendously. Anyway, go back in history with David Astle's Babylonian woe and see how many times before paper money this wonderful gold system crashed. Oh, it would be wonderful if we all had some gold. Yeah, but we don't have any gold. Jeez. Oh, this is Lou Rockwell. <laughs> okay. First of all, there'd be more oh, no. jobs. Better jobs, more secure jobs. Yeah, if we only had some gold, there'd be better jobs. They never say where we'll get the gold, do they? More business opportunities. No more business sites. Yes, and no yes. more recessions. If depression. only we had more gold and chips. savings would be secure. Yes. You wouldn't have to worry if you put away money for your old age that its value would be stolen by the central bank and by the central government uh, as they are today. Under a 100% gold standard, there would be no place for fractional reserve banking. <laughs> Under a 100% gold standard, most people would starve. For checking accounts and other demand deposits, the banks would keep reserves on hand to meet depositors' claims. Bank <laughs> Moving yellow rock around, you know. <laughs> banks would receive a fee from their customers for keeping their gold. Oh, a fee In to keep your banking, gold. Investors would hand over their money for a fixed period of time to earn interest. Ah, oh, lucky investors of gold earning interest. You think these guys own gold? <laughs> earning interest? Once the gold standard is in place... I know, we want to use interest-free poker chips based on our collateral, and we're giving up the chance to be loan sharked golden ones. <laughs> based on the same collateral. Individual bank depositors would always have access to their money, and investors would be kept informed of their balance sheet. And at a national level, a tight rein would be kept on government spending. That's right. A lot of unemployed people could be building bridges, but tight rein on government spending. Sorry, King Henry, we ran out of tallies. No more twigs left. <laughs> Stability. You have uh, a stable purchasing power. Oh, what a dinosaur. Eliminate How the, sad, uh, eh? Cycle. You have reasonable interest rates rather than gyrating interest Reasonable rates. death gamble rates. Political manipulation of interest rates and political manipulation of the money supply. Nice and, set uh, fixed uh, death gamble rates. builds wealth and allows for economic growth. It's as simple as this. Sound money means economic prosperity and limited government. Unsound. What? What a lot of boy. Uh, unsound money means collateral backed money. He means inflation, recessions, and depressions, and big government. Looney Ludwig, inflation, unsound money. What sort of system do we want for our families? Certainly ain't gold we ain't got enough of. Don't we want prosperity and security that we can hand on to future generations? What about the guys living under the bridges? What kind of prosperity is that? No gold for their paychecks. Transition to a gold standard will not be easy. But Ooh, a lot of poor people are going to starve in the process. <laughs> so the rich can remain with their interest. As Murray Rothbard put it, the alternative is much worse. Oh, you think so, eh? I like King Henry better. Murray, <laughs> glad you're dead. Since 1980, the Fed has enjoyed the absolute power to do literally anything it wants. Ooh. To buy not only U.S. government securities, Ooh. but any asset whatever. Ooh. To buy as many assets and to inflate credit as much as it pleases. <laughs> If they're taking in the assets and issuing the credits, called buying, how is anything inflating? Jeez. There are no restraints on the Federal Reserve. The Fed is master of all it controls. The 
because it charges interest on top of that, what these clowns forget the whole time. What a bunch of losers. Ludwig! For more information on the Looney Ludwig! Write the Ludwig von Mises Institute, Auburn, Alabama, 36849-530. Ludwig the loser! Or call area code 334 Also available from the Mises Institute is The Case Against the Fed, an insightful examination of the Federal Reserve's operations by Murray and Rothbard. You can bet that's not worth the money. <laughs> that's it. Money Banking in the Federal Reserve by Looney Ludwig's von Mises Institute. Austrian economics. Gold buffs. Yellow rock. That's the way to go. Star Trek money. Okay, so that's my critique of the von Mises Institute's Austrian economics saying we need gold to run our chips right. These guys aren't only flogging a dead horse, they're flogging a dead dinosaur. It's time to get high-tech credits worth hours of labor is the perfect money, and it can be done online and no interest. So look into it. John the Engineer Termel, and if we move fast, we might be able to use the Argentine solution to bury nuclear before it blows up and kills us all. Look for my YouTube video, Pet Fish Dead, Kids Drink Same Water, and Wake Up.